So we did an episode on whether the black hole at the center of the Milky Way can consume the entire Milky Way. Uh, spoiler alert, no. Uh, but you had a bunch of great questions. I thought we would start to tackle some of your questions about our episodes uh, and just put those into the feed. So I gathered up a whole bunch of questions that you had about black holes, and now I'm just gonna tackle them here. So, there's two sizes of black holes that we know of, right? There are the stellar mass black holes. These are the ones that are formed when a star with many times the mass of the sun explodes as a supernova and collapses down and forms this, this black hole. And you get somewhere between, I forget the number, six, 10, 12 times the, the mass of the sun for a stellar mass black hole. And then there's the supermassive black holes that have been around pretty much since shortly after the Big Bang. There's some connection between the galaxies inside of them and the black holes themselves. There's no natural formation that can form a black hole that has lower mass than one of these stellar mass black holes. There's no process in the universe that can make this happen. So the, the one possibility is that there were these primordial black holes that were formed back shortly after the Big Bang. And it's kind of amazing to think about. The density of the universe back shortly after the Big Bang was so high and so hot and so dense that you could have these places of, of higher density where you would have these black holes of maybe an asteroid's worth of mass or an Earth's worth of mass just spontaneously be formed just because the, the, big, the universe was just so, compressed so tightly. And so then maybe these primordial black holes have just been floating around the universe ever since, evaporating, exploding when, they were, when they've completely evaporated. So, so far there's no evidence that these primordial black holes exist right now. And there's no method, natural method, that you could do to get a black hole that's formed anyway but the death of a star. So gamma radiation is just another form of electromagnetic radiation. There's radio waves, infrared, visible light, you know, go through the rainbow, uh, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays, but it's just a different wavelength of light. And <clears throat> black holes can absolutely uh, suck up gamma radiation. Gamma radiation needs to follow the, the paths of space-time, and if there is a uh, black hole there that's that's distorting space-time the gamma radiation is going to follow that path right in and if the black hole itself is is generating gamma radiation it's still all getting absorbed because you have to be going faster than light speed to be able to escape the black hole so you no know, black holes can absolutely uh, eat up all the gamma radiation uh, out there So the whole point of a black hole is that it is, it is an object where the escape velocity is faster than the speed of light. So for the, for the least possible mass black hole, you're, you're going to be right at the speed of light is your escape velocity, which is impossible. So you just can't go faster. So I guess the question is that if, if you could go faster than the speed of light, which you can't, then every black hole is going to have a different escape velocity. One that is you know, just formed as a black hole might have an escape velocity of the speed of light. But then a supermassive black hole with millions of times the mass of the, of the sun is going to have an escape velocity that is hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of times the speed of light, which is impossible on top of impossible. Yeah, so every galaxy so far seems to have its own supermassive black hole. And there's a few, a couple of exceptions, but in general, there is a supermassive black hole at the heart of every galaxy. And these, these supermassive black holes can interact when the galaxies themselves collide. And so you can have these situations where one galaxy and its black hole will steal the galaxy's black hole from whatever it collided with, and then maybe you're going to end up with these two supermassive black holes orbiting some central gravitational point, like a binary planet or something, or a binary star system, and you've, but they're two supermassive black holes. And so this other galaxy's had its, its supermassive black hole stripped out of it, 
and this galaxy has two of them in it. And then we can theoretically be able to detect the gravitational waves that are emanating from these interactions between these supermassive black holes. So to have multiple supermassive black holes, you kind of have to steal one from somewhere else. One of the ideas for supermassive black holes was that maybe there's this in-between size, these intermediate black holes, and maybe if an intermediate black hole gets massive enough, it becomes a supermassive black hole. But these intermediate black holes have actually been really hard to find. Astronomers have looked inside uh, globular star clusters and still haven't even been able to find them. So it's a big mystery right now. So a quasar is really just a supermassive black hole, but one that's actively feeding, where the material is falling in, it's coming in too quickly, the black hole can't clean its plate fast enough, and the material you know, goes up onto this accretion disk that surrounds the black hole, and then these magnetic fields form, these, these jets come out of the black hole, and it becomes very, very bright. But a supermassive black hole and a quasar are literally just the same thing. They're just two different forms. One is actively feeding, one isn't. So what happens, can they interact? They can absolutely interact. They can orbit one another. Uh, they could collide and form an even larger black hole. And maybe that you know, more massive black hole would have more capacity to absorb material. So you know, they're, just, they're really just the same thing, but just at different phases. Once material has become a black hole, it can never go back. There's no return back to a star. There's no way to decrease the density of the black hole back to the point that you could then turn it back into a star. The black hole, as we've talked about in other episodes, is going to evaporate over long periods of time. And then when it, as it evaporates, it becomes lower and lower mass, gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and eventually, it's just gonna explode, or at least it's that final little bit of energy, and then it's gone. And there's no way to get back to a star. When a supermassive black hole tears apart these stars, what you're seeing is the Roche limit of the black hole and the star that it's interacting with. So a star is coming in on a comet-like trajectory. It gets within the Roche limit the, the place where the gravity of the, of the black hole overcomes the gravity of the star itself holding it together, and it gets sort of torn apart into this disk of material, and then it gets added to this accretion disk. So the, where that exact point is it depends on the mass of the black hole, and it depends on the mass of the star itself and the density and, and, and so on. But, it, but that's essentially what you're seeing is these stars get torn apart as they're getting within that Roche limit of the black hole. You go first and then you report back on how it worked out and, uh, and if, if you're still okay then maybe we'll follow. So that's a great question, right? Like, why are the SETI astronomers looking for radio waves when they could be looking for visible light? They could be looking for X-ray, gamma rays, etc. It's that ra we know that radio waves can be transmitted across vast distances. We do this all the time. We know we can receive radio waves within the Earth's atmosphere. So it's, it's one of those things that we're hoping that aliens will be kind enough to us and sort of think about where we are in the technology tree that they're going to say, well, they're probably at the radio spectrum level, so let's transmit in the radio spectrum because we're pretty certain that every alien civilization out there is going to discover the radio spectrum. There could be more exotic forms of communication, probably are, much better ones like neutrinos or whatever, but we haven't even mastered the physics of, of neutrinos yet, and so it would be kind of mean for them to use this advanced system and not then uh, allow us to be able to join the conversation. So, so we're just assuming, you know, we're imagining in the mind of the aliens that they're going to use a technology that's probably super outdated. They don't use it anymore, but they do it, they use it for the quaint new aliens that they're going to meet and they send out these, these messages. So that's, that's, I think, why astronomers do that. But astronomers are looking for uh, directed uh, optical light. They have a thing called uh, where they're—it's like OSETI, where they're looking for optical light from 
from other places. People are considering neutrinos. And uh, one of my favorite is called uh, Weddy, uh, waiting for extraterrestrial civilizations. And you just like, you just hang out and wait for them to show up. You don't need to communicate. So uh, there's a lot of different ways that, that we can look for them. And radio is just the one that kind of makes the most sense. So the idea of Hawking radiation, this is that the black holes evaporate because these virtual particles are peering right at the event horizon of the black hole and one's zipping off into space and one's falling into the black hole and this energy can't come from anywhere. It has to come from the mass of the black hole and the black hole gets smaller. So the question is, you know, could you make it happen faster somehow? Well, the only way you can make it happen faster is to take the black hole and put it in a freezer so that it is surrounded by a place that is colder than the black hole itself is. Because right now, the supermassive black holes and stellar mass black holes, they are currently colder than the universe itself. So they're just gonna keep getting warmed up by the universe. So the only way you could speed it up is to take them to some place, put them in a freezer, and really make that freezer cold so that then the evaporation can start to really get rolling on the black hole. But it's not gonna speed you up much. It's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna make it, them go away any faster. And you need a really big freezer. Yeah, there are the stellar mass black holes, there are the supermassive black holes, and there are the super duper uh, mass black holes where these galaxy clusters have come together and the supermassive black holes have interacted with each other and merged and they have billions and maybe even trillions of times the mass of the sun. They're, they're incomprehensible how massive these things are. This is still a point of argument between astronomers. What seems to be the case is that there is some connection between the mass of the black hole that's in the galaxy and the formation and age of the galaxy itself. Which one formed first? We don't actually know. And it might be that, that they both formed together as the galaxy gets bigger, the black hole gets more massive. It's there's some natural process there, but it's actually still a mystery. Maybe. So astronomers still don't really know how the, the first, uh, the big supermassive black holes formed, but they do know that a regular star, there's a limit, so around 65 times the mass of the sun, where they can't get any more massive. And when they do explode, they explode just they, without a black hole, without any remnant at all. They just disappear and they sort of completely explode. So we know that you can't get a black hole with a much more massive star. There had to be some other formation, whether they were formed right from after the Big Bang or whether clouds of, of the sort of primordial gas left after the Big Bang just came together and formed those first supermassive black holes. Astronomers don't know, but they do know that you can't get a star any bigger and have it actually form a black hole. Now, it's possible that early on, the stars are pure hydrogen, so there's other models for how these, these really, really big stars. I've seen simulations where people have done 65,000 times the mass of the sun to, to try and simulate what that could turn into. So it's still a, a big mystery and a big point of contention. But today, these days, no, you, you can't get them. Well, thanks a lot for asking all of your questions. I pulled those questions from the comments on the YouTube channel. But there's a couple other ways I'd love to get some questions from you. One is that you could ask me a question on Snapchat or on Instagram. My account is fcain, F-C-A-I-N, on both networks. And then you could record yourself and ask a video, and then I will try to grab the video and play it in, the, in this, and I think that would be a lot of fun. So keep asking your questions on YouTube. Shorter questions are better. And then go ahead and ask some video questions on Snapchat or Instagram. Uh, F. Kane, and I will try and tackle those in a future question show. All right, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time.